Objection. Granted that the dangerous impulse to eat kalanja and the like may stop when the natural erroneous notion about their edibility has been removed by the recollection of their true nature as harmful things, but the tendency to do acts enjoined by the scriptures should not stop in that way, or they are not prohibited. Reply. Not so or both are due to erroneous notions and produce harmful effects. Just as the tendency to eat kalanja, etc., is due to a false notion and productive of harm, so is the tendency to do acts enjoined by the scriptures. Therefore, for a man who has a true knowledge of the Supreme Self, the tendency to do these acts being equally due to a false notion and productive of harm, will naturally cease when that false notion has been removed by the knowledge of the Supreme Self. Objection. Let it be so with regard to those acts which are done for material ends, but the regular rites which are performed solely in obedience to the scriptures and produce no harmful effects should on no account stop. Reply. Not so. Or they are enjoined on one who has defects such as ignorance, attachment, and aversion. As the rites with material ends, kamya, such as the new and full moon sacrifices, are enjoined on one who has the defect of desiring heaven, etc., so are the regular rites enjoined on one who has the root of all evils, ignorance, etc., and the consequent defects of attachment and aversion manifesting themselves as the quest of what is good and the avoidance of what is evil, etc., and who, being equally prompted by these, tries to seek good and avoid evil. They are not performed solely in obedience to the scriptures, nor are rites such as the Agnihotra, the new and full moon sacrifices, Chaturmasya, Ashubandha and Soma Yaga intrinsically either rites with material ends or regular rites. They come under the former category only because the man who performs them has the defect of desiring heaven and so forth. Similarly, the regular rites performed by a man who has the defects of ignorance, etc., and who out of natural promptings seeks to attain what is good and avoid what is evil are intended for that purpose alone, or they are enjoined on him. On one who knows the true nature of the Supreme Self, we do not find any other work enjoined except what leads to the cessation of activities. For self-knowledge is inculcated through the obliteration of the very cause of rights, that is to say, the consciousness of all its means, such as the gods. And one whose consciousness of action, its factors, and so forth, has been obliterated, cannot presumably have the tendency to perform rites, or this presupposes a knowledge of specific actions, their means, and so on. One who thinks that he is Brahman, unlimited by space, time, etc., and not gross, and so on, has certainly no room for the performance of rites. Objection. He may as he has for the inclination to eat, and so on. Reply. No, for the inclination to eat, and so on, is solely due to the defects of ignorance, etc., and are not supposed to be compulsory. But the regular rites cannot be uncertain like that. They cannot be sometimes done and sometimes omitted, according to one's whim. Acts like eating, however, may be irregular, as they are solely due to one's defects, and these have no fixed time for appearing or disappearing, like desires for rights with material ends. But the regular rights, although they are due to defects, cannot be uncertain, for they depend on specific times, etc., prescribed by the scriptures, 
Just as the Kamya Agnihotra, which is a rite with material ends, depends on such conditions as the morning and evening because it is enjoined by the scriptures. Objection. As the inclination to eat, etc., although due to defects, is regulated by the scriptures, so the restrictions about that Agnihotra, too, may apply to the sage. Reply. No, for restrictions are not action, nor are they incentives to action. Hence, they are not obstacles to the attainment of knowledge, even by an aspirant. Therefore, the Vedic dicta inculcating the true nature of the Supreme Self, because they remove the erroneous notions about its being gross, dual, and so on, automatically assume the character of prohibitions of all action, or both imply a cessation of the tendency to action. As is the case with prohibited acts, such as the eating of forbidden food, Hence, we conclude that, like the prohibitions, the Vedas delineate the nature of realities and have that ultimate aim. Namaste. So this is extreme Advaita. Keval Advaita means unmixed with any other views. Now, in our study of consciousness, here's the good old chart, we see that the perfect realization of Brahman is Turiya consciousness. And in Turiya, the world, the body, the mind, the individual, and so on, are viewed as unborn, that they never were. They now exist. They can't exist because there is nothing but Brahman. Now, to realize this Brahman, is the goal of Advaita. And when one realizes Brahman to that degree, he has no more attraction to any material activities, even the sacrifices of the Vedas and so on. Although these sacrifices are made, as Shankara admits, for pursuing the good and avoiding the evil, still, because they are based in the bodily material conception of life, they are not necessary for one who has realized the Brahman. Now, this puts the lie to the neo advaitins because they say, well, we have realized Brahman simply by knowing about it. So we don't need to do any sacrifices. We don't need to do any meditation, study the scriptures, perform austerities, and so on. Because we already got it. But then they go out and they indulge in all kinds of material activities. So can we say they have actually realized Brahman? No. For this reason, the whole Neo-Advaita thing is a farce. It's simply a scam to avoid accepting a guru, studying the scriptures, performing pujas, austerities, developing love of God, etc., etc. All the activities recommended in the Vedas. These are not to be given up until one has realized Turiya. At that point, one becomes an avaduta, and avaduta has no desire at all for material things. He may eat, he may not eat. He may keep the body, or he may give it up. It really doesn't matter. Why? <laughs> because the pleasure of realization of Brahman is so much beyond anything material that those material pleasures just seem like useless tinsel. Huh? in the words of a uh, great sage of India. So why do we pursue these things at all? Because they purify us and prepare us for the realization of Brahma. Even though from an absolute viewpoint they are unnecessary or even harmful because they invoke the bodily conception of life, 
the material conception of duality. Still, they are better than living like an animal with no religion, no guidance of Vedas, and so on, in ignorance. So knowledge is better than ignorance, but realization is even better than knowledge. Why? Because when one becomes Brahman, or actually realizes that one has always been Brahman, then there is no more need for any other enjoyment, because Brahman is full and complete Sat, Chit, and Ananda, existence, consciousness, and bliss. And these are not mere philosophical concepts. This is the actual experience of the Advaitin, who is fully realized. Now, in the beginning, one gets an idea about Brahman and develops the desire to realize Brahman. He is still under the authority of the Vedas, and he must perform the various duties as given in the Vedas. Otherwise, he falls down. But one who has realized Brahman is no longer obligated to perform any activities, including the Vedic sacrifices and so on. He's completely free. And the marker, the indicator, the quality by which we recognize such a realized soul is that he is utterly independent of any material enjoyment whatsoever. So when one realizes that stage, one can give up the Vedic sacrifices and so on. But not until then. If one precipitously gives up Vedic ways, then one simply falls down again into ignorance. Why? Because he has not become purified. His ignorance has not been fully removed. And so as soon as one stops whatever sadhana one is doing, without that full realization, one falls down into the material pool again. Bloop. <laughs> so this is the understanding that Shankara's extreme points of view and arguments are based on the presupposition of complete realization of Brahma. Partial realization of Brahman is also wonderful, but it does not give a sufficient basis for complete renunciation of all Vedic activities. This is very important to understand. Otherwise, one becomes a cheap neo Advaitin uh, and simply, in the name of being realized, falls down into material nonsense again. So we don't support that. Neither does Shankaracharya, and certainly neither do the Upanishads. So what we should take away from this whole argument and debate on this verse, the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad, chapter 1, Brahmana 3, verse 1, is that Vedic sacrifices are meant for those who are trying to overcome evil. Evil means suffering. So if we're suffering at all, it means we're affected by evil. So what we have to do then is to perform the Vedic sacrifices purely and that is the aim of the gods, the devas, in trying to defeat the demons, the asuras, by performance of the Udgita. Huh? Remember, this is the Udgita Brahmana. So, by performance of the Udgita, which is a certain type of Vedic ceremony, recitation of the hymns of the Sama Veda by the Udgatre priest, in a homa, or Vedic sacrifice. By performance of these rites, the demigods were able to defeat the demons, and the rest of this chapter is going to be the story of how they did so. 
And we can learn from all of this that the power of mantra comes from the fact that speech is fire and fire is purifying. For example, if you have a dirty piece of cloth or something, you can hang it out in the sun. And together, the wind and sun purify it to where it doesn't smell anymore and so on. So this is the purificatory power of light, fire. Light is the symptom of fire. When fire is there, there is light. Where does the fire come from? It comes from the air, prana, movement of air. Movement of air is the life force, the vital force. And by identifying with this vital force, we can create prana and make fire and purify our whole existence until we're actually qualified for complete enlightenment. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.